Welcome to Conversations Live. For more than a decade, we've brought you the best in books, entertainment, celebrity interviews, and current events. When the movers and shakers of the world have something to say to you, they say it to us first. Here's your host, Cyrus Webb. And welcome back, everyone, to Conversations Live. I'm your host, Cyrus Webb. Glad you all could join us once again before a radio audience here in Mississippi at WYAD 94.1 FM and WYADonline.com. We're glad that you all could be with us. Also, it's tuning in to online affiliates around the world, including our friends at Our Heart Radio and Amazon Music Podcast. We're glad you all could be with us as well. We're excited to welcome award-winning journalist and author Jory Lewis to our program today. Jory's celebrating her new book. It's called Slaves for Peanuts. A story of conquest, liberation, and a crop that changed history. And let me just tell you, if you think you know about about peanuts, no matter where you live, in Mississippi, around the country, even the world, I think this book has some really eye-opening facts that a lot of us, including myself, were not aware of. We'll talk to Jory not only about the writing of the book, but also the deep research she was able to do and what she hopes this book does for you as the reader. Jory, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me, sir. Well, I have to say, and I think anyone who's picked this book up and begun to read it, uh, Jory, they do not doubt the the intense research you had to do for a book like this. But with that being said, what is it like for you now to be able to have the book out and see the conversations coming from it? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's really gratifying that um, so many people have taken up the book and really, really uh, appreciate it. Because it feels kind of, um, you know, basically the book came out in America, but it's about it's about West Africa in the 19th century. So it's really interesting to see an audience for this this book about a subject that's not usually on people's minds. And and that is such a great point, Jory, because I think when I when the book was first pitched to me, I said yes because I was fascinated by the topic. But I have to say, when I began reading it, I I, I thought to myself, I knew none of the history. Not even I mean, you even go into into how peanuts grow. I didn't even know that part. <laughs> so I mean, so I'm sure that a lot of people's minds will be blown just by that. So what was it like for you to be able to have these these accounts, this history opened up to you, and then now to be able to share it in a book like this? Well, I mean, I think it's you know it, it had been a long journey for me to to write this book. I think I've been working on it for like maybe seven years. <laughs> you know? Wow. So, I mean, it, it took a lot of sort of deep research in archives and oral history on the ground. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the writing of the book was a lot of labor, you know, a labor of love, as one would say, but definitely a lot of labor. So I, I introduce you as an award-winning journalist, uh, Jory. It is no surprise that agriculture is one of the things that you are known for exploring in your work. What was it, though, about the history of peanuts? And, and this, particularly when it comes to slavery coming down to our time, what was it about peanuts that first got you interested in this? Well, I have been living in Senegal for some some time. So I first moved to Senegal in, in 2011 uh, on a sort of fellowship to study food security in the region. And, um, you know, peanuts are, are still one of the main crops. I think it's, it's probably still the major crop for Senegal. Senegal for you know, over 100 years, nearly 200 years, has been one of the top uh, 10 peanut-producing countries in the world. So I knew I wanted to look into the place of the peanut in the rural economy. I think it was, so that was kind of like a no-brainer. It was like a natural direction for me. But um, I think the, the, the sort of way it enmeshed with the conversation around um, enslavement was a kind of, you know, it was like a, a you know road to Damascus moment for me. You know, <laughs> like I had I had a it, it, yeah it came as a surprise, and then I I just started to unpeel the layers from there. Wow. And in this history, you're not only able to take us into, as the title alludes to, jury slavery, but also I think the idea of ownership and power, and how it wasn't just always one race. Or a group of people, you know, out after another. What was that like for you to peel back those layers and to see the, the the power structure that that was in place, and and how not only this crop but also the power that came with it kind of impacted people's lives. Okay, thanks for that question, Cyrus. Um, 
You know, of course, in America, the sort of type of slavery that we're used to kind of talking about in in the Americas in general is kind of race-based slavery. It's racial slavery. But, of course, slavery existed in many places, and it didn't always have a racial component. But, you know, enslaved people were typically strangers, so they were from another place, another kingdom, you know, over the mountain, down the hill, or whatever, and, um, you know, they, there are many societies that had kind of a place for enslaved people and enslaved labor. And, I, yeah, I think one of the goals of the book was to kind of broaden that understanding, not in any kind of, like, it wasn't any sort of argumentative way. I know that sometimes we get into a conversation about um, the relationship of, say, like, uh, of, of Africans to the transatlantic slave trade, but for me, I just sort of take all of those things as given. I wasn't here. I wasn't trying to have a kind of argument or present an argument about a thing, but just to say that we all, you know, there are these societies that are really complex and sometimes hierarchical, and in some places there are, there's a range of different types of of ways people lived the lived enslavement. And at the same time, that the um, relationship of enslavement within Africa doesn't al- doesn't also just sort of exist in a vacuum. That it is also itself influenced by the transatlantic, transatlantic slave trade, and it, as it sort of changes position, it accelerates. It it, it changes its the kind of flavor of it as well. So all of those things, I wanted to bring a kind of complicated, complex view of of. Of, of enslavement and of, of history, of African history in general. Jory, how much of this, and I thought about it after reading the book and prepping for this segment with you, how many of this, even though history is a very big part of it, how much of this also is for you for us to better appreciate agriculture and appreciate the peanut and what we get from it and its role in our lives? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, um, you know, the peanut is, in my, in a way, a kind of character in the book. So, yeah, there's a kind of embodiment of the, of the peanut. So, the, yeah, I think you get the sense that I really appreciate the peanut. And it, it's, you know, the funky way it grows, right, the, the way it sort of grows in the soil. It buries its fruit in the soil, and it's beautiful yellow flowers. So I think that, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a part of it. The peanut has a kind of role in the book that's like semi-villain, but it's also semi-hero. Because I think the the way that the peanut um, is sort of um, operates within the society sort of changes and shifts over time. Um, and I think that interpretation is still out there, you know. I think there's still an opportunity to see as the peanut, the peanut as, uh, as, as villain or hero if we want to, but... That it's um, yeah, it's just a cool little plant with a tasty, you know, a tasty nut that um, you know, a tasty legume that 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 produces you know oil and so many other things. Right, and I think that is one of the things that definitely comes through in this. And I mentioned that earlier. I mean, in the way you talked about, you know, if it, if it is not boiled or roasted, how you you know, literally how you can plant it. I, I never. I'm from Mississippi. I didn't even know that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's mm-hmm. and the way it grows. So I, I was just curious as to that appreciation, how much of that you hope came through. I want to say for those who are just tuning in, either on the radio side or online, you're listening to Conversations Live. We're excited to welcome award-winning journalist and author Jory Lewis to our program today. Jory is celebrating her book, Slaves for Peanuts, A Story of Conquest, Liberation, and a Crop That Changed History. So I want to talk about the, the latter part of the subtitle there, Jory, A Crop That Changed History. What was that like for you to discover Or maybe a better question would be to ask you, how much of this history did you know going into the book, and how much kind of unfolded as you were doing the research? Uh, Yeah, I don't think I knew very much of the history. (laughs) I'm trying to think. Okay. um, Yeah, I mean, I don't think – I knew the basic – you sort of outlined, like I I said a little bit earlier, that I knew – that the peanut was a very important crop in Senegal. I knew it was also associated with a number of religious movements, which I kind of allude to at, at the end of the book. That the, this kind of um, yes, these kinds of religious movements sort of took up the cause of peanut later and in, uh, in the in the early 20th century and sort of grew it on a wide scale. 
so I knew that that was kind of basic information, but in terms of like the broader history about like about Latjor, I didn't. I only knew the bare bones about Latjor's story um, and the, the conquest of this part of Senegal, his particular kingdom, and I didn't know anything about this this uh, mission for runaway slaves that I that I spent a lot of time on in the book, and I I even didn't know very much about um, like not just Walter Taylor, but the the community in Sierra Leone that he came from. I didn't know much about them. I knew, I knew that Sierra Leone had been settled by people who had come from, say, like Jamaica and, you know, parts of, of other British colonies, but I didn't know that there was a whole kind of movement of people who had been um, semi-enslaved, who had been forced into slave ships and then brought back to Sierra Leone. So all of that was new to me. Uh, in general, so I, yeah, there was just a lot of learning that went went on with, went, that went on kind of uh, writing this book. Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, as we're kind of looking at, um, well, I think, well, let me say this: one of the things that struck me as an interesting parallel to today, uh, Jory, was the fact of again the influence and power and the lack of appreciation for the people who were making the crop possible. For the others, and I, and I think that 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 also, I'm sure people will look at that and say, well, today, you know, corporations, businesses don't always appreciate those, you know, who are basically making them rich, you know, and being able to, to have them to have what they have. What were those parallels like for you to look at, looking back at the 1800s, and then thinking about the role of the power struggle, and you know, and the way that people were treated, uh, and the way people kind of look at themselves today. What was that like for you to look at? Uh, you know, it's always a little bit um, sort of discouraging sometimes <laughs> to think about. <laughs> like the more that, the more time goes past, the more like certain like structures of domination just continue to reproduce themselves. Right. So I mean, yeah, exactly. I think that's part of the um, part of the kind of uh, lesson of the book is that this kind of extractive, um, you know, peanut farming both sort of destroys the environment, but also, uh, you know, it's at the same time allowing a certain a certain sub seg- segment of people. So yeah, let me start again. So it's both expanding the demand for enslaved labor. But then later is also allowing some uh, some of the enslaved the opportunity to free themselves. But at the same time, it's like further in t- sort of putting them into chains to a kind of colonial economics economic system. Right. So there are these all this is like an up and down. You know, like you, your your emotions are like, oh, maybe this is the solution, but the solution is never never sustainable if the whole system doesn't change, right? So the system of extraction that led to enslavement is still the same system of extraction that leads to the kind of colonial relationship that these farmers are are, are maintaining and who are kind of basically forced through like in, indebtedness and uh, taxes to, to continue to grow a crop that you know they may well like and there are lots of things that are good about it but that is still nonetheless something kind of imposed on them. So I think that's definitely something we see, you know, almost everywhere. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's it's even sort of crazy. And even in Senegal I was just reading an article recently again just like about peanuts. So like now what's happening to the peanut economy is that it's um so Senegal's still growing a lot of peanuts but I read that some 90% of the crop is being exported to China, and they're exporting most of it untransformed. So that means like not um, they're just exporting the nuts rather than like processing it into oil. Because if at least they processed it into oil, they would have like more. Um, we would capture more of the money related to the peanut and capture more of the value chain, and so provide like factory jobs and other types of jobs. But now they're just kind of like exporting it. So there's a kind of like short-sightedness still on the part of a, let's call it a, a kind of dominated state, right? So like Senegal is a poor country, like vis-a-vis a richer country that just kind of like lets that richer country come in and pillage its wealth without kind of capturing any benefit from it, except for like the the lowest level of benefit. Yeah. 
And I think, again, that's why this conversation is so fascinating, but also timely, Jory, even though we're looking at history that some people may feel detached from, there is a connection here. And I think that's what this book is able to help us to be able to see. Again, everyone, Jory Lewis has been our guest. The book is Slaves for a Peanut, a story of conquest, liberation, and a crop that changed history. It's available through our friends at Amazon.com or through your favorite local bookstore if they don't have it. I know they'd be more than happy to order it for you. And, Jory, I really appreciate you stopping by. How can our audience stay connected with you? Yeah, you can uh, follow me on Twitter or Instagram. I'm at Jory Lewis, or there's my website, which is www.jorylewis.com. All right, well, Jory, congratulations to you again. Really appreciate you stopping by and looking forward to our next conversation together. Thank you so much. Hey, more than welcome, and we thank your audience for tuning in to another great segment of Conversations Live. Until next time, I'm your host, Cyrus Webb, saying as always, enjoy your day, enjoy your life, enjoy your world. Thank you all for choosing Conversations Live, and it's going to make today amazing. Take care. <laughs>